Welcome back in a moment to the joys of building with wood. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. Colombians have been marching for peace in the capital, Bogota. This week saw a potential peace agreement between the government and the FARC rebels voted down in a close-fought referendum. President Jean Manuel Santos has said that at the end of this month, a ceasefire agreed with the guerrillas will come to an end. Nine Australians who were arrested for posing in swimwear at the Malaysian Grand Prix have been released after their first court appearance. The group was detained after stripping down and decorating themselves with the Malaysian flag to celebrate fellow Australian Daniel Ricciardo's race win. Commemorations are taking place in Bangkok to mark the 40-year anniversary of the Bangkok campus massacre. At least 46 students were killed and many more injured when a campus demonstration was attacked. Survivors gathered to lay wreaths and scatter flowers in memory of those lost during the event. From the 1930s onwards, skyscrapers transformed many a skyline around the world. They're usually built from steel or reinforced concrete frameworks with walls of glass. But now leading architects have put forward an idea for a timber skyscraper, claiming a timber tower would be lighter, safer and greener than its metal counterparts. Insight correspondent Sarah Firth tells us more. London's iconic steel skyline might be in for a makeover. Along the silver landscape, some innovative researchers and architects have pictured a timber tower reaching to the sky. That might seem like a stretch of the imagination, but PLP architects, along with researchers from Cambridge University, have come up with a conceptual plan for London's first timber skyscraper. They've envisaged an 80-storey, 300-metre-high wooden building called Oakwood Tower. The tower is made of component parts that are brought to site in three-storey units. The top of the tower is really very spire-like. In Holland, tall buildings are described as cloud scratchers. And this is sort of the intention, that we create a spire form that tapers and rises to the clouds. The idea is that the wooden structure would sit on top of pre-existing building. As well as being lightweight and quick to assemble, the structures we're told have some unexpected benefits. People like wood. People actually feel more relaxed with wood in its surroundings because they associate it with nature. And what we're finding in studies, scientific studies and, that, and psychological studies, is that people relax, they become more sociable, they're a little brighter as well, apparently. But the notion really is that wood and cities in urban set, dense urban settings may improve the well-being of people generally. It might just be a proposal for now, but wooden buildings are already a reality. New York already has tall timber towers, and plans are in the pipeline for Paris and Amsterdam. And this structure in London is known as the smile. It's said to represent the happy face of the ever-evolving timber revolution. Well, the structure allows you to come inside and take a look at the timber up close, and it really is beautiful. And structures like this have been made possible because of a pioneering technology known as CLT, or cross-laminated timber, and it's what all of this is made of. As well as being easy on the eye, CLT, it's claimed, is stronger than concrete and better for the environment. So with so many benefits, why aren't we all living in timber structures already? Because putting up a wooden building is like a giant piece of furniture, so you can build with it really fast. So that, apart from the sustainability, that's the big advantage. The, but of course, as I say, all materials have pros and cons. The, now, one of wood's disadvantages in being quite lightweight is that it's a bit more susceptible to vibration. The, um, you have to be a bit more careful with your acoustics to get acoustic separation between apartments. So, um, the, but it, that, that's why I say that it's, it, it has to be right for the particular use. If the 19th century belonged to iron and steel and the 20th century to concrete, timber, that old construction material, could be set to become the hallmark of the modern age. Sarah Firth, reporting for Insight. For more conversation on this, I'm joined by Anthony Thistleton, who's the co-founder of War Thistleton Architects, 
And also with us in the studio is Michael Ramage, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Architecture at the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Anthony. Um, what for you is the appeal of exploring possibilities with wood? I think the principal appeal for us is climate change. When we build in concrete, we use a lot of carbon dioxide, produce a lot of carbon dioxide through energy use and the chemical reaction that creates concrete. With wood, we store, con we store carbon, absorb during the growth of the tree, and then we store it for 100 years or more during the lifetime of the building. So that's the principal, um, principal advantage for us. But actually, timber construction is lighter, it's faster, and it's better quality. So it's a greater finish in that sense. Are there architectural challenges or possibilities opened up by using this technique? Absolutely. Um, every time, as an industry, we change materials, we tend to use what we know. So with the first iron bridges, they look like wooden bridges. Um, our steel and concrete buildings evolved over time to make the best use of that material. And now our timber buildings tend to be mimicking what we know in engineering, construction, and architecture from concrete and steel. And it will be a couple of years, uh, maybe a decade, before we really maximize the best potential of design with wood. Of course, if we're familiar with American movies, America, Canada, lots of other countries will use timber constructed buildings. But we're not talking the same beast here, are we? You're, you, you've got a new sort of composite, com a compound almost you put together. Tell us about the engineering that goes into the, this, this type of wood you use. Well, the principal timber we use is cross-laminated timber, so it's, it's like a jumbo plywood. Instead of using thin laminas of timber, we're using big planks that are glued together in, in, in gigantic sheets. They're about so they're not just pure trees cut up and assembled into a building. Is there an expense in that process, the cross-laminating, the gluing, the preparing for use? I mean, there, there, is, there is an expense. I mean, it's, it's a processing, it's a, it's a refinement of the material that does increase the cost. But the boards themselves, once you, when you actually compare cross-laminated timber construction with uh, concrete construction, the cost is about, is about even. So there's a, the, you're building the same building as a concrete building without any increase in cost. But what you are getting is something that's quicker and, and better quality. What about longevity? How do they last? Or do we not know yet? Because you only just started making these things, I suppose. Well, we have only just started making them, but the material has been tested. Um, it's, it's, it's guaranteed for, for 60 years, but there's no reason why it shouldn't last any longer than that. I mean, we, I would expect the timber buildings that we've now built to be, to be around in 100 years. Simplistic analysis might think, gosh, is it going to fall down? first bit of wind that comes along. But tell us about the engineering of these buildings. Are they as strong and as resilient as, as concrete and steel? Uh, absolutely. Um, for one, the material is capable of withstanding incredible loads, in fact. Um, and it's generally underperforms whenever we use it um, because we don't value its strength. But also, as responsible engineers and architects, we are bound by well thought out codes for the most part and we will always adhere to those. Um, so it's not that timber can't match steel and concrete, it's that we haven't really explored how well it can do it at large scale buildings. This process is just starting out, isn't it? What about, what about the flexibility? As I understand, as buildings get larger and larger, um, and we're not talking about skyscrapers literally 60, 70, 80 blocks high at the moment, but those buildings have to have a degree of flexibility, haven't they, to literally bend in the wind. Can you do the same with timber constructed buildings? Yes, all buildings have to, have to bend and sway and, and move with wind um, or in parts of the world with earthquakes. Um, and we have to engineer the buildings in timber so that they move within a reasonable limit. Um, we know what those are because humans are quite susceptible to <laughs> feeling those movements. Yeah. Um, and the stiffness of the material is one of the engineering challenges uh, to make it stiff enough, um, but it's certainly doable, and we've seen examples of constructed buildings and experimental results that show that it's entirely feasible. And it's not just purely cosmetic, putting a bit of timber on what is essentially a steel structure. You can climb several floors high just with the, these um, timber panels? These, these timber panels, are, we're currently completing a building that's 11 storeys tall, and it's entirely constructed from these timber panels. The, no the, steel shell underneath it all? No steel shell. The lift core is timber. In fact, the fire stairs are all timber. It's, it is a timber structure completely. Wood burns. Does this stuff burn? Every, I mean, everything, 
everything deteriorates in fire, steel melts in fire, concrete can fracture in fire. Timber, uh, timber does burn, but it burns in a, in a very predictable fashion, and the charring of the timber does form a protective layer. So within the fire strategy of a, of a timber building, we're actually protect, we're using that capacity of the wood to protect itself as part of our fire strategy. And the, for the cosmetics of this, some of the projects I see, conventional bits of cladding or external decoration, um, conventional windows, of course, would go in. So when you finished your job and the project signed off, I, as a member of the public, just walking past, am not really aware it's a timber building. That's a shame, isn't it? Why does that happen? I, th I think that's a huge shame. But I think we're at the, we are at the dawn of the timber age. And what we're doing at the moment is proving that we can build similar buildings, building that meet people's expectations. What does a block of flats look like? and be built in timber. Once, we've actually, once we're now at that tipping point where we've achieved that, and I think as we go through the next decade, two decades, three decades, an architecture of timber will emerge in the same way that on the, in the dawn of concrete, mm. it took a few decades for an urbanism and an architecture. <laughs> there were a few mistakes along the way, weren't there? Well, <laughs> Some ugly buildings out there. Of course there were, and we'll make mistakes in timber, there's no doubt yeah. of that, but I think when we look back in 50 years' time, I think we'll see very clearly a, an architecture, a new architecture of timber, and, a new urbanism of timber. What about the construction limitations of change of use? As I understand it, a lot of those concrete buildings are deliberately built with lots of lateral strength, so you don't need, you can take walls down, you can change the landscape of your office, or you know, one firm leaves, another firm comes in and builds all sorts of false walls. That's less easy to do, I think, isn't it, if the honeycomb structure is in place? As long as one designs the building with its future changes in mind, uh, we can, as engineers and architects, we can certainly achieve that. Um, buildings that are designed originally as residential buildings tend to stay that way if you can't change the sure. walls. But if and they're you look relatively small-scale rooms, I suppose, aren't they? Yeah. But, I mean, for instance, a big um, atrium-like building like an airport terminal or something, that wouldn't be suitable, would it? Uh, for a timber sort of It certainly approach? could be. There are some very, very large timber halls, um, current and historic. Uh, most of our heritage buildings in the UK have a very large timber component, um, and they're doing just fine today. Well, you can design roof spans and stuff that are self-supporting without? Absolutely. The earliest airport hangars from World War I with very long spans were actually relatively simple timber structures. Um, and we see them move onward um, with very large scale, either cross-laminated timber or glue-laminated glue timber, which is similar, um, but actually better suited to very long spans. We have a long possibilities, um, and there are, there are many existing buildings, such as ice rinks and, and other things, the, that have very large timber components. Oh, it's a fascinating area. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we end with our insight bite. This is a little something that we feel you should know, and today it's a farm on the West Bank. A trio of Palestinians there have launched a community supported by organic farming project on a hill overlooking an Israeli settlement. The dedicated group looking after the four-acre plot of land hope it serves two purposes, to provide food security for local community and to reduce dependence on outside crops. And that by using the land, it might keep it from being built on and turned into part of a nearby settlement. Currently, the farmer is producing sweet potatoes, peppers, lemongrass, kale and spinach. Sounds very healthy. That's it for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Insight.